Amen. Uh, the title of this morning's sermon is, He Must Increase, But I Must Decrease. And today's sermon will be different because I'm doing outline, not manuscript. Well, I want to start off by saying this. I want to start off by saying that it can be difficult at times to have joy, joy, especially as we wait for Jesus. Joy, what is, what is that? What are we talking about here? We're talking about a true and deep happiness, a true and deep satisfaction, an understanding of just our triumph in Christ. It's a true and deep happiness of the fact that we are saved, that we are loved by God, the satisfaction that we have all the spiritual blessings in Him. This is what we're talking about here, joy. But it's not easy to have joy, especially when we are sick or injured or when we see this world and all the terrible things that are happening in it. It's difficult to have times of joy when we are struggling with sin. It can be hard to be joyful when we're saying goodbye to people we care about. If this is you, you're not alone. We all struggle with this, this lack of joy. But today's passage is so good for us to hear. I needed to hear this as I was getting ready for this sermon, and I hope you realize you need to hear this too. It's so good for us to know and hear that God loves us, that he has given us this verse, these, these verses, this story, for our benefit, for our Christian life. And the idea here is really simple. John the Baptist, he had joy. If you look at what he says, it's so true. And the question is, can we be like that too? Can we live like John the Baptist lived in having joy in Christ? Let's look at the drama really quick, the background, the story, what's, what's happening, what was the setup here? It's really simple. There's Jesus and there's John the Baptist. Side note, John the Baptist is not John, the author of the book of John, okay? So Jesus and John the Baptist, and both of them were baptizing people. They were baptizing people in different regions. John was baptizing in the southern area, Aeon, near Salim. Jesus in the northern area, Judean countryside. Small geographical note, but simply put, they're not baptizing the same people. They're different. And so John's disciples, they have this discussion with a Jew we don't know exactly who that is referring to, nor what exactly they were talking about, except purification. But the point here is that these disciples ended up going to John, John the Baptist, and they told John the Baptist, hey, everyone's going to Jesus. All the people, they, they're getting baptized by Jesus, not you. And what's implied there is that they didn't like that. They were maybe, maybe they were jealous. Maybe they felt a little bit threatened by Jesus. It's like, hey, John, you're our guy. We love you. And, dude, you were the man back then. But now, everyone's going to Jesus. <laughs> but listen to what John says. See his joy. And ask yourself, where does that joy come from? How was it that he was joyful? even though he was losing all of his so-called fame and people were not going to him anymore to be baptized. They were going to Jesus. If you look starting in verse 27, pretty much every verse, everything that he says is packed with deep meaning. In verse 27, what John does there is he acknowledges who God is that God is, is his heavenly father who is sovereign over his life. So he says, a person cannot receive anything unless given him from heaven. That is 
of really deep truth. No one gets anything unless it is given to Jesus or given, given to us from the Father, given to us because of his love, given to us because he is in control. Our God gives. You know, earlier in this worship service, we were talking about how God gives us wisdom. Well, John here is saying, all in all, overall, he starts off by saying, hey guys, look, everything comes from God the Father. And what he's getting at here is that God should get all the glory. God has given us salvation, and God should get all the glory. And so that's, that's, that's where he starts. And that's where his joy is rooted. That's what his joy is really rooted in. It's in this knowing of the Father. It's, it's knowing who the Father really is, who his God is, and having confidence in that. <coughs> but that's just the start. In verse 28, John the Baptist goes on to say, <clears throat> <coughs> this is a mask from church. Not my mask. Something's going on here. John goes on to say in verse 28, guys, I was sent by Jesus. This Jesus who you're now comparing me with and you guys are like, hey, you know, he's taking all of our, all of our baptisms. Guys, I was sent by him. I serve Jesus. I bear witness to him. And I'm not him. I'm not the Christ. What's going on here is John knows what he is not. And he knows what he really is. He's not the Christ. He's not the center of the universe. He's not the person with the party. Instead, he knows that he is merely the one who is sent for the party to get people to enter that party. He's just the messenger. He knows that. He's, he's acknowledging, hey, guys, I'm just a servant. I don't have to worry about that, that the, all the baptisms are going to Jesus because he's my master. This is really awesome that he's saying this. You bear witness that I'm not the Christ. I've been sent before him. And so John knew who he was. He knew his purpose. He knew that he served Jesus. There is some gospel truth there. When Jesus saves us, we finally know who we really are. As Christians, as brothers and sisters in Christ, we know for truth, and we truly know what our purpose is our identity and our purpose is is that we were made to worship God and to serve Jesus. Our identity is we are God's children. We're God's people. And part of the good news is that wow, we 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 have been given work to do by Jesus. We are sent as well. Not in the same way exactly as John the Baptist, but we are to be the salt and light. We are to share the gospel with others. And there's joy in that too. And so John's joy was rooted in knowing who God was and knowing who he was. If you look in verse 29, the first part of 29, John's joy really reaches a high point because he talks about a wedding. He talks about this story, this metaphor of a friend of the bridegroom and then the bridegroom and the bride getting married together. It's kind of similar today. The friend of the bridegroom today would kind of be like the best man, but back in those days, in the Jewish ways of doing uh, weddings, this friend of the bridegroom, okay, his job was to serve the bridegroom, to set everything up, to arrange the wedding, do the invitations, preside over the feast. And, and that's all good, but there's a really cool thing where we're, 
don't, we don't know exactly like what the traditions are, but at, at a certain point, the bridegroom speaks. His voice is heard, and the friend, his friend, hears that. And that's the moment of culmination. That's the moment where it's like, yes, this wedding is it's finished, it's done, it's happening. One could say that in a modern wedding, I try to wonder what could be the parallel for us today. It's when, if you're sitting at the wedding, when you see the, um, the groom walk down the aisle. He doesn't say anything, I know, but maybe in a modern way, that's like, that's like the moment where the voice is spoken. I'm here. <laughs> I've entered. This wedding has begun. And the best man or the friend should be standing there and being like, yes, all the work I did, all the stuff, it's, it's, it's meant for this moment. And I'm here to tell you today, as a pastor who's done many, many weddings, um, there's great joy in just seeing that happen, in just stepping back and just knowing that it's all about the bride, all about the groom, that this is their day. And I'm just thankful that I'm here to just be a part of that and to help that make, make it happen. And I'm not saying that joy is greater than the joy of the actual bride and the groom. Heck no, no way. But that is John's joy. And that is our joy too as Christians when we think about our relation to Jesus. Jesus, who is the bridegroom for the church. Jesus, who has loved and married the church institutionally, okay? Not you individually. Don't be like, ew, Jesus married me? No. But Jesus has married us, the church, as an institution. The church is the bride of Christ. And so John says this, a friend of the bridegroom stands and hears him, and the friend of the bridegroom is talking about himself, I rejoice greatly because Jesus has come, because the bridegroom has entered into time and space, into history. Jesus became flesh and has dwelt among us. Why? So that he could marry his bride, so that he could save his people, that is the church. And John is saying, I'm just his friend. I'm not the bridegroom, guys. Let him have all the baptisms. Send all of our disciples over to his. I'm okay. Why? Because this is his wedding. This is his story. And I'm just his friend. And I'm here to help it happen and watch it happen. And I'm just so happy that Jesus has come. That's what John's saying. You can understand this, right? Many of you have been to weddings. Many of you can imagine what it's like to be married. Great joy. And so, to all the folks who were uh, helped out at Abe and Maria's wedding, there's great joy. I hope you, you learn, we learned that as many of you have done many, like three, four, five, six weddings now. And I hope, I hope you really can relate to what John is saying here, John the Baptist. Christian life really is a wedding party, isn't it? It should be. And Jesus is the star. The church is also the star. The marriage between Jesus the bridegroom and the bride, that is the church. That made John truly happy. Verse 29, he says this really awesome statement, therefore my joy is now complete. I've talked enough about joy, but there's that word right at the end that is really, really fascinating. It's the word complete. His joy is, it's all put together. It's final, it's, it's done, it's, it's, it's all wrapped up, it's finished. And what John is getting here, what our God is getting here is that when it comes to history, 
John was looking forward to this his whole life, so to speak. And everyone before John, if you think about it, because what makes John really special, even though he says, I must decrease, Jesus must increase, John is special because he's the last Old Testament dude. He's the end of an Old Testament era that was full of promises. It's not a bad era. It's a great time because it's a time full of promises. Just like it's a great time leading up to a wedding. It's really fun to like, Okay, maybe not fun, but it's really exciting to anticipate a husband and wife getting married. That's like the Old Testament. And John, he's looking forward to that as the very last guy, the last Old Testament prophet in history. And now Jesus has come. And what John is saying when he's saying, my joy is now complete, he's, he's making a very profound statement. He's saying, the time has come. This is finished. Something new is happening. And I have done my duty in the old era. And all the promises that I've been waiting for is coming true now. It's complete. Therefore, my joy, my joy in looking forward to this gospel, it is now complete because that gospel has come true. It's happening. Jesus has come. The wedding is now. So who cares if Jesus takes all of my disciples, all the baptisms? I don't care. My joy is complete. History is fulfilled Salvation has come and it's over. We won. God's promises came true. And I'm the last guy, I'm the last Old Testament guy, and oh my gosh, what a day. That's what John is saying. That's the joy. Can you feel it? Not from me, but can you feel it from the Word of God, from Him? This redemptive historical joy, this historical joy, time and space joy John seeing what he's seeing and saying and realizing wow it's happening the thousands and thousands of years from Abraham to King David to even through the exile and it's complete my joy is complete in a very weird way though I dare say John was kind of wrong because while his joy was complete, it's not ultimate complete. We have true joy now. We can. We should. Jesus, he's come. He's, he died for you. He rose again from the dead. He's ascended, and now we're waiting. So in one sense, you and I, we should have great joy. But you and I have no idea John the Baptist, to this day, he's just a spirit right now in heaven. His body is here on earth. And all the saints, same thing. None of us have a clue what the ultimate joy is going to be like when we see Jesus face to face in the new heavens and the new earth. None of us can even begin to understand or imagine a world without sin a world without suffering, without crying. That is when joy is going to be redefined in ways that you and I cannot, we're going to be blown away. And that's something to look forward to. And so I dare say, because I'm kind of scared to say this, even though John is correct, my joy is now complete. There is a real sense in which our joy is the ultimate joy is still to come. By the way, I can't wait to meet John the Baptist. I hope you look forward to meeting him too. What a man. What a godly, classy man in this text. Let's wrap it up with the last thing that he says here. Again, we're looking at John's joy. We're thinking about our own joy and seeing if we can put that together. 
John's famous ver, uh, words at the end in verse 30 is this. He must increase, but I must decrease. Jesus must go up, I must go down. Increase, decrease. What John is saying here is simply, Jesus must, must be of greater significance right now, and my significance must go down. It is true. John the Baptist was a big deal. He was important. He was the last guy. Think about all the people that he shared the gospel with. He helped that. He was a part of that. But now that Jesus has come, it was time for him to fade away, to decrease. I think I did this at Abe and Maria's wedding, but at the end of the wedding, what usually happens is the husband and, bra and, and wife kiss. I've learned through the years what to do now when that happens. Usually, you know, the bride and the groom, they, you know, they're right there. And then usually the officiant is right there, ruining the photo, okay? And so it dawned on me, I should step away. And uh, I think this is the first wedding I've done that, I think. It took me a while to realize that. I apologize to all the other weddings that I've done. But at Abe and Maria's wedding, when it was time for them to kiss, I got out of the way so that number one, the photographer doesn't have to take a picture of me, not photogenic, and ruin their perfect picture. But two, more symbolically, and in my heart, it's, it's, it's not about me. It's their, it's their wedding. Jesus must increase. I must decrease. This, this does not mean that you become nothing. It doesn't mean that we as Christians, we just belittle ourselves or we have low self-esteem or anything like that. But it simply means that we must exalt Jesus now. It's all about Jesus. It's, it's, it's his party. It's his wedding. And we want to just give him thanks and praise. He is the supreme king. We are not. And so he must increase as we decrease. This is not easy to do. In our old cells, we, we want it to be about us. <laughs> I'm sure there's YouTube videos everywhere of like siblings, but one is, is, their, is their birthday party. And so the cake is for them. The candles, they're going to blow it out. And then you see the sibling. Usually it's the younger one. They don't know exactly what's going on. They're like, I want to blow the candles too. <laughs> but it's not their party. And then they cry because the parents are like, it's not, you know. But then parents usually let them blow it together and then they learn later on oh, it's, it's, it's their siblings party. Uh, that's a funny little illustration, but if you stop and think about it, this is Jesus' world. This is Jesus' church. This is Jesus' story. And the irony is when we make it about ourselves, we lose the joy. But when we make it about Jesus, it works. Some of you have heard me say this, but I think it's brilliant. I, I think it's in God's sovereignty that the word joy is spelled J-O-Y. And that's a perfect way for you to remember what we're talking about here in the sermon. Joy is spelled J-O-Y. And those three letters stand for Jesus first, others second, and then yourself at the end. Brilliant. It's perfect. I love it. Thank you, God, for the English language. That's actually the best way to live the Christian life. If you put yourself first, though, you don't get joy. You get yaj, or you get why. If there's no Jesus in your life, but you put others above you still, and then yourself, you just get oi. Not joy. Hey, oi. You're doing it wrong. You work out all the combinations. I would even argue some Christians do it wrong and it's only about Jesus and it's not about others or themselves. That's weird. That's rare. That's not joy either. That's just the letter J. True joy. Highland. Can we do this? John did this. Can we do this?
putting Jesus first, knowing that he must increase, that I, you, the letter Y, must not go in the front of the word, but in the back. He must increase. Others must be loved. And then there can be us. That is joy. Brothers and sisters, I know, though, that it's hard to have joy in times like these. I'm sad that my, our brother, Pastor Peter, is leaving. It is a struggle to have joy when we struggle with sin. We look at this world, there are really terrible and sad things happening. It is not easy to have joy. And it's certainly not easy to have joy when you're sick. Brothers and sisters, John is a wonderful little example for us. And I really pray that you have learned something more about joy, where it comes from truly, how to have it fully in your Christian lives. May the Lord help us all to have true joy. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for a reason to have joy, and it's all about you, Jesus. Oh, Lord, this is your wedding party. May you increase, and may we decrease. Oh, Lord, please teach us, train us, so that we may understand and live out joyful Christian lives, putting you, Jesus, first above all. Help us as we sort through our feelings, as we sort through drama in our lives, as we face challenges and turmoils and sadness that is real. But we can still have true joy. And so help our church, we pray, may Highland Church be filled with this part of the fruit of the Spirit, joy in Christ. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.